If you don't, these people around me on the platform do, and so it forces a person to spend a lot of time thinking through what he wants to say because they don't give you much time to say it here. Um, most people I know long for authenticity. If there's one thing we want in others is that they be real. Uh, we probably have as little tolerance for hypocrisy as any part of life. Jesus reserved his strongest words uh, to be used against the hypocrites. Now, the difficulty is that we are in a work and you are training for a work where it comes uh, sort of with the territory. Um, the worst kind of hypocrisy is religious hypocrisy. And uh, you will pick up tendencies toward that even during your years at seminary. And I just want to guard, help you guard against doing that and urge you to be real, just who you are. Um, I was uh, several years ago sitting with our younger son, Chuck, when he was still a, uh, in, uh, he was a preteen, as a matter of fact. And uh, we were channel surfing and uh, came across a televangelist who was uh, doing his thing. One of these guys with about nine strands of hair, very creatively woven into a rug. And uh, he was performing and yelling and screaming. And right in the middle of his sermon, Chuck said to me, and Chuck's never been known to hold back. Um, I don't know who he gets that from, but... Um, he said, Daddy, uh, why does he say God? <laughs> why doesn't he just say God? And um, I thought, that's a great question. It's a great question. We can be phony when we preach. We can come across as insincere and faking piety. Um, I had a neighbor stop me uh, earlier this year and tell me that he and his wife were sort of weary of where they were attending church. And uh, he had a great question for me when he said, uh, we're, we're thinking about coming out to uh, Stonebriar. It's where your church is in Frisco. I said, yeah. He said, uh, I just have a question. Do y'all have real Christians out there? That's another good question. I said, well, um, some. Uh, there are times I'm not altogether real. He's, no, no, you know what I mean. I mean, people that are more like Jesus than those folks that we spend most of our time with. I said, yeah, that's the part I'm answering. That's the tough part. I'm not talking about being real as in being raw. I'm talking about being real as in being Christ-like. That's our goal, isn't it? I know it's mine. One man wrote it this way, um, what is Christ-likeness? It's not physical resemblance to Christ. Physically, the Lord looked like all other men. On the night of the betrayal, Judas had to arrange a sign so that arresting Jesus, uh, so that those arresting Jesus would know which one he was. He looked like everybody else. It's not a cultural similarity. If it were, then if some descriptions of first century Holy Land customs can be trusted, he would we would walk about in sandals and wear long flowing robes and speak Aramaic and, and all men would have beards. Nor is it following him in every outward step and circumstance. If we imitated him literally, we would be carpenters till the age of 30. And then we would leave secular work for three years of itinerant preaching, avoid marriage and family life, show little interest in art, science, 
or national affairs often sleep outdoors and go about penniless. Many medieval Christians mistakenly thought that to fully follow Jesus, they had to take vows of celibacy and poverty. Many think that Christ-likeness is imagining what Jesus would do in every situation, then following his supposed course of action. Such contemplation can be provocative. However, a major difficulty is that our conclusions are based on imagining what Jesus would do. Then I like his summation. Christ-likeness is having the mind of Christ. Now, that's a good answer, uh, but if you're like me, you need something a little more specific than that. What does it mean to have the mind of Christ? How does that work its way out? Over in Hebrews 13, verses 1 to uh, 8, I find uh, six snapshots of Christ's likeness. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list nor would these necessarily be at the top of all the lists, but here are six snapshots. So let me give you the snapshots and then I'll tell you a story and we're through. We want to think about being a real Christian. There's no course at seminary that'll cause that to happen. There's no Authenticity 101. There's nothing in your past that will automatically cause you to come out real. On the contrary, probably unreal. Especially if you've been taught to fake it. And again, ministry is an easy place to fake it. So let's take some snapshots and let's see if how we fit in the frame of each one of, the, of these uh, snapshots that occur. Let love of the brethren continue. So the first snapshot is love for others. Love for people in the family of God. That would include being kind and affectionate, thoughtful, staying on good terms in our relationships, uh, showing ourselves as being genuinely interested in others, helping them in unselfish ways. That's all part of loving our brothers and sisters. How you doing there? Let's just allow that heat-seeking missile to hit us in the chest today. How you coming along in your love life for others? You don't do it here, you're not gonna do it when you're out of here. So it's a great place for there to be a laboratory of love going on. Loving your partner in marriage. We'll deal with that a little more in a moment. Loving each one of your children. Loving your mom and dad. Start there. Loving fellow classmates. Loving your faculty members. And your faculty members loving you. Love for the brethren. That's snapshot number one. Look at the next one. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Second snapshot is hospitality. Hidden in the word hospitality, or translated hospitality, is the term for strangers. So these would be people we're not acquainted with. But we show kindness to them. Hospitality to strangers. I, uh, every time we have a worship service at uh, Stonebrow Community Church, I precede the uh, time of worship by having everyone stand up and greet someone they don't know. Uh, it could be ritualistic or it could be genuine. I hope it continues to be genuine. I want everybody to say by the time they left that somebody spoke to me today. Somebody cared enough to reach over and take my hand, look me in the eye, and say hello. Uh, some are reluctant to do that. We always have a few on the fringes that sort of uh, 
they're sort of there to uh, not participate, but just sort of take in and then leave. And that's not a church, and that's, that's not Christianity. Uh, some of you are becoming a little more aloof as you are getting more information. You're becoming harder to live with. Now, I haven't talked to anybody uh, about you. I just, I just know seminary life can do that to you. You get a little weird. And if the longer you're here, the weirder you get, which says something for faculty to stay a long time. And uh, if, if, if they're not careful, they get very weird. And so, thankfully, they work on not being weird. Thankfully, they still are friendly. They still are reaching out, some more than others. You know that. Uh, Caring about people you don't know, folks in the grocery store, somebody pumping gas as you're there at the station pumping gas. Um, stop off at the dry cleaners, somebody is there. You, you speak to them. You show hospitality. You reach out. They'll be surprised to know you're in ministry because they don't expect ministers to do that. Uh, I've always tried to understand why. That's true. One of the reasons I encourage people to reach out at our church and greet one another is because every once in a while you shake hands with an angel. You never know it. I mean, there's not little wings getting ready to pop up out of their shoulders or something like that. But every once in a while, dropping in on our services, there would be an angel. Maybe, maybe two or three times in my lifetime that might happen. That kind of gives new, new meaning to greeting strangers, doesn't it? Sometimes wonder if uh, an angel manifests herself, himself here uh, in our midst at, at the seminary. So we're told to remember or to not to neglect to show hospitality. That's a second snapshot. Okay, how you doing there? Take a little look at your friendliness toward those you've never met before. Number three, remember the prisoners as though in, prisoner, in prison with them. And remember those who were ill-treated, since you yourself also are in the body. So the third snapshot is compassion. It's a snapshot of a person who genuinely cares about folks who are in trouble. <clears throat> One paraphrase reads, regard prisoners as if you were in prison with them. Look on victims of abuse as if what happened to them had happened to you. When's the last time you did anything related to prison work? When's the last time you shook the hand of a prisoner? When's the last time you prayed for a family left while their mom or dad is in prison? See what I mean? It, uh, it gets more and more aloof. Uh, and how about people who are ill-treated? They're victims of molestation or some form of abuse. They're everywhere. They fill our churches. We're told here to remember them. And it's not just a, thought, uh, just a passing thought, but it's a, the idea of having hearts that go out to them. First response to uh, prisoners is a judgmental response. He's getting what he deserves. Uh, we're, we're pretty tough on prisoners. And uh, some of them certainly deserve the consequences of their wrong actions. If, in fact, they are wrong and they are guilty, they need to be punished for that. I'm not soft on it. But I am, I am uh, more and more interested in seeing compassion grow in our ranks. It's not a trait of a liberal. 
for some reason it's wound up in the liberal camp. Uh, I had a fellow say to me when I was ministering in New England and uh, we did a radio talk show and I had never met him before. He was from a liberal wing of a denominational uh, area and, and uh, we got to know each other and we had been on the, on the air about two hours. So when we finished, we were walking out to our cars and he said, uh, Swindoll, I want to ask you something. Uh, where, where'd you pick up his compassion? He says, it doesn't fit your training. Didn't you go to Dallas? And I said, yeah, I did. Love Dallas Seminary. He said, but it's not a school known for compassion. I said, have you ever been there? He said, no, which that's always the answer. You know, I've never been there, but I know all about it. And yet it kind of stung because I, I had to wonder is, if he's right. How come we're not known for compassion here? Or if we are, how come it, the word isn't out? What is it that's made us a little more harsh and judgmental, more intolerant? Convicting, isn't it? I feel conviction when I share these thoughts with you. Compassion is uh, uh, probably a few character traits more like Christ than compassion. Verse 4. Let's use the word purity. We're taking snapshots here. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. This is a snapshot of marital fidelity and sexual purity. Has in mind being faithful to our vows and until vows are made at an altar, remaining pure sexually. So purity is in mind and it is another command that we hold marriage in honor. It's not complicated, it's not confusing, it's written to those who will be known as real Christians or wish to be known as that. Verses 5 and 6 have to do with contentment. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Be in content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you so that we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? In other words, being truly satisfied and comfortable with your current lifestyle, free of the obsession to get more, courageous enough to swim against the stream of materialism, comfortable and satisfied knowing that you are in the midst of the work of God and that uh, financial gain will most likely not come your way. Contentment. I think that's part of what my neighbor had in mind when he uh, told me he's looking for a church that has real Christians. Um, and he mentioned some things that were going on in his church and I never commented, I just listened and I told him he was welcome but we were a long drive from where he lives and he probably could find just as good a church on his way and if he's not pleased with the one he's in because of the things he named, uh, then he, he probably ought to seek one where he can really find a sense of, of, of fulfillment for him and his wife and their family. Uh, he mentioned the sort of emphasis on money and, and greed and uh, ever, always wanting more. So I, I, I thought contentment comes to mind as it relates to verses 5 and 6. Now seventh and, or sixth and finally, consistency. Remember those who led you. Boy, this is great. Remember those who led you. Let me pause right there and have you do that. Call to mind 
in, in the faces the names of people who have led you. Pastors, teachers, coaches, parents, mentors, maybe the one who led you to Christ, might have been your roommate in college. Maybe it goes back to your high school days, someone who led you there as a model. Remember those who led you. And especially remember those who spoke the word of God to you, considering the result of their conduct. Imitate their faith. Then he adds the greatest model of all, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. One of the wonderful uh, qualities that I, look, that I notice in people that I've admired is a consistency. Never really that hot, never really that cold, just a consistent. And I don't mean this to sound boring, but there's a sameness. Year after year, when you're with them, it's like you've never left. They're the same. They're there. What a great model. Okay, there you have it. Love. Snapshot of love, hospitality, compassion, purity, contentment, consistency. Now the story. Before I read you the story, I, I want to uh, give one final word of application. In your ministry, I hope you will form the habit of noticing the little guy. Taking time for those who don't show a lot of promise. Understand as we're, we're moving through life and we're ambitious and we're driven and we're at times almost neurotic about getting our goals and objectives accomplished, it's easy to kind of walk over some folks. Form the habit of not walking over anybody. Another great quality of Christ is he always noticed those that others would have walked past, ignored. Prompts me to read this. A good friend of mine sent it to me. At the prodding of my friends, I am writing this story. My name is Mildred Hondorf. I'm a former elementary school music teacher from Des Moines, Iowa. I've always supplemented my income by teaching piano lessons, something I've done for over 30 years. Over the years, I've found that children have many levels of musical ability. I've never had the pleasure of having a protege, though I have taught some talented students. However, I've also had my share of what I call musically challenged pupils. One such student was Robbie. Robbie was 11 years old when his mother, a single mom, dropped him off for his first piano lesson. I prefer that students, especially boys, begin at an earlier age, which I explained to Robbie, but Robbie said that it had always been his mother's dream to hear him play the piano. So I took him as a student. Well, Robbie began with his piano lessons, and from the beginning, I thought it was a hopeless endeavor. As much as Robbie tried, he lacked the sense of tone and basic rhythm needed to excel, but he dutifully reviewed the scales and some elementary pieces that I require of all my students. Over the months, he tried and tried while I listened and cringed and tried to encourage him. At the end of each weekly session, he'd always say, my mom's going to hear me play the piano someday. It seemed hopeless to me. He just didn't have the inborn ability, I thought. I only knew his mother from a distance as she dropped Robbie off or waited in her aged car to pick him up. She always waved and smiled, but she never stepped in. One day, Robbie stopped coming for piano lessons. I thought about calling him, but assumed because of his lack of ability that he had decided 
to pursue something else. I was also glad that he stopped coming. He was a bad advertisement for my teaching. Several weeks later, I mailed to the students' homes a flyer of the upcoming recital. To my surprise, Robbie, who received one of the flyers, called and asked if he could be in my recital. I told him the recital was for current pupils, and because he had dropped out, he really didn't qualify. He said that his mom had been sick and unable to take him to piano lessons, but he was still practicing. Oh, Miss Hondorf, he said, I'll, I've just got to play. I don't know what led me to allow him to play in the recital. Maybe it was his persistence, or maybe it was something inside me saying that it would be all right. The night of the recital finally came. The high school gymnasium was packed with parents, friends, and relatives. I put Robbie up last in the program before I was to come up and thank all the students and play a finishing piece. I thought any damage Robbie would do would come at the end of the program and I could always salvage his poor performance through my curtain closer. Well, the recital went off without a hitch. The students had been practicing and it showed. Then Robbie came up on the stage. His clothes were wrinkled and his hair looked like it had been run over by an egg beater. And I thought, why, why didn't he dress up like the other students? Why didn't his mother at least make him comb his hair that night? Robbie pulled out the piano bench and began. I was surprised when he announced he had chosen Mozart's Concerto of number 21 in C major. I wasn't prepared for what I heard next. His fingers were light on the keys. They even danced nimbly, nimbly on the ivories. He went from pianissimo to fortissimo, from allegro to virtuoso. His suspended chords that Mozart demands were magnificent. Never had I heard Mozart played so well by someone that age. After six and a half minutes, he ended in a grand crescendo, and everyone was on his or her feet in wild applause. Overcome and in tears, I ran up on the stage and put my arms around Robbie in joy. I've never heard you play like that, Robbie. How'd you do it? He stepped over to the microphone and explained, well, Miss Hondorf, I remember, you remember I told you my mom was sick. Actually, she had cancer. She passed away this morning. And well, she was born deaf, so tonight was the first time she ever heard you play. I wanted to make it special. There wasn't a dry eye in the house that evening as the people from social services led Robbie from the stage to be placed into foster care, I noticed even their eyes were red and puffy. And I thought to myself how much richer my life had been for taking in Robbie as a pupil. No, I never had a protege, but that night I became a protege of Robbie's. He was the teacher and I was the pupil. It is he who taught me the meaning of perseverance and love and believing in yourself and maybe even taking a chance on someone when you don't know why. This is especially meaningful to me today since after serving in Desert Storm, Robbie was killed in a senseless bombing of the Alfred P. Murrow Federal Building in Oklahoma City, April of 1995, where he was reportedly playing the piano. All through your ministry, you will have Robbies. Some of them will be age 11, some of them will be 15, some will be in their 20s, some will be in their 40s, some will be much older than you. And just seem, it may seem like they're not worth it. Busy as in, and as important as you become. Remember, they're looking for real Christians. real Christians. 
As I heard Joe Aldridge say a number of years ago from this pulpit, people won't really care how much you know till they know how much you care. Keep caring. As you get smarter, keep caring. As you find yourself in demand, keep caring. It's very Christ-like. Thank you, Father, for the, the reproofs that come when we just pause and take time to think a little deeper. Thank you for those who cause us to slow down and see things we've not seen before. Help us with our love to be genuine. Give us the courage to reach out to people we've never met, to care for the abused and those behind bars. Strengthen our purity. Keep us contented in your son, Jesus, and in the calling he has placed in our lives. And may the result of a consistent lifestyle be that which causes others to come to a knowledge of Jesus. I pray for each person here, each precious life, each treasure, being prepared for your work, that you'd help each one to become increasingly more like Christ. I ask it in Christ's name.